Yeah. Hopefully we're getting back to some normal, uh, whatever normal is. We have to redefine it. Um, good morning, Facebook. Glad to have you here. Good morning, the rest of you all. I hate all um, y'all. You know what? I think next week we're going to put it back down. <laughs> because cause it gets in the way of me seeing these folks. Uh, okay. That way then I don't have to see my face as much. So um, I know we've got a few that are absent today. Um, we were all absent last week uh, due to the nice uh, ice that had accumulated. Uh, so it's good to be back in the Word and I hope I picked up in the right spot um, as we get going. And uh, for those of you that are watching, Pastor Dan is here so we will probably hear him chime in, I hope, I pray. Uh, during the time. Uh, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this day as uh, again we can get into your word and, and just let that word unfold before us. Uh, pour out your Holy Spirit to, to bring discernment and wisdom and understanding uh, so that we are properly equipped uh, for our faith and for that expression of faith to others so that we can uh, be those people to walk, come and walk alongside others who don't understand. So guide us and lead us in our time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I'm correct, we are in Luke chapter 12. I think we finished off the, the woe to the Pharisees and uh, all those things that they were doing and we ended there, as Jesus went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. I think that was going to probably be easy to catch Jesus in something he might say. Because how many times did Jesus say something that they didn't like? <laughs> Constantly, and, and so uh, so we pick up from there uh, into chapter twelve, and again try to remember the connections from verses previous and how this is all unfolding, uh, and and connecting those with what what has gone on before. Uh, so if somebody would read just the first three verses there. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together. They were tramping one another. He began to say to his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the roof housetops. Okay, uh, continuation on, um, but notice who he's speaking to. Right. You know, even even though others are there, there's a few others who are there, because Luke Luke tells us very clearly, um, this is not a small crowd that's around. Um, when at, when so many thousands of people had gathered together, so many so that they were trampling on top of one another. Um, Interesting statement there is, you know, how many of you have ever been in, in a large crowd? An extremely large crowd. Football stadium size crowd. There you go. Um, I, I think from that you can get, a, get an understanding of that they were trampling one another. Uh, people just get in the way or some someone to move a little faster than others um, in some regards maybe they were doing that because they wanted to get closer to Jesus um, but again Jesus' attention is on the on his disciples uh, and it says he began to say to his disciples first. And again, this is just a follow up of what just happened. You know, 
Pharisees uh, in the previous chapter. Now he now he's telling the disciples, don't be like these guys. Be Yeah, leaven, leaven raises. Uh, it causes something that is small to expand. Um, and, and obviously the leaven of the Pharisees is not what you want to bake your bread in or bake your bread with. Um, and, he, and he calls it hypocrisy. Uh, mask wearers um, because then they were putting on a, a mask of being the righteous ones when underneath that mask was something completely different um, interesting thing that the commentator put uh, he, he equated the hypocrisy with apostasy can we make that jump can, can we make the jump that hypocrisy is apostasy? And as some of you Google, what's apostasy? Okay. Who in here right now and who's watching on Facebook? Which one of you's which ones of you are hypocrites? Oh. <laughs> right. Which ones of you are apostate? Thereby, exactly what you're saying, Forrest, is it's a big jump. It's a big jump. Um, can hypocrisy lead to apostasy? That I think you can say, yeah, if you dwell long enough in it, uh, it will lead to that. And, and again, we, we see that in, in the acting of the Pharisees. And that's what leaven will do. The, 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 leaven, the leaven will take that action of hypocrisy and cause it to continue to rise and to grow out of that. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, in defense of that commentator, in what, I mean, what sin isn't apostasy? True. Really. True. Honestly, I am in full agreement with that commentator, um, and I would expand on this thought. I mean, this is no different than Luther's assertion that every sin is ultimately a sin against the first commandment. Right. Which is apostasy. Right. Every, every sin separates us. Absolutely. Yes. Every sin is a matter of placing something right. before God. Every sin. Because God has laid out what it means for him to be first. And, and I think what's happening here, and I don't like to go ahead, but I'm going to go ahead. I, I think Luke, Luke is setting up what is coming up next. Because apostasy, ultimately, what happens with, with apostasy? So, so to me, it would be a hypocrisy to apostasy. What does that word apostasy? What does it mean? Apostasy is um, the lack of faith. Oh, okay. You know, um, so hypocrisy is is you're you're a mask wearer you you claim to have faith but but deep down inside you're exhibiting those things that are not faithful where the apostate will he's plumb pulled off his mask okay he, he's not covering it up um May I offer a, 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 a definition of apostasy? It's to judge God. 
Okay. This would be an apple state. Okay. Judge God. Yeah. That might be a, a, an easiest, the easiest way to think. Right. Because then what... Placing God under your judgment. Right. And what then comes next, and, and this is where Luke goes in the next few verses, then will be uh, specifically in verse 10. What, 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 is the, what is the final shoe to fall? In, in, God is judged on the cross. <laughs> Well, well, that, but I, but I mean, it, for the unbeliever, for the unbeliever, yeah, we we know God is judged, yes, but for the unbeliever, if we if we follow from from hypocrisy to apostasy, what is what is the final judgment of the unbeliever? Well, you take Christ's place on the cross, and good luck with that. Right, and and that's blasphemy, where where you reject. The thing that creates that faith that you have, you know, because still being an apostate, yeah, you're in bad shape, but you still you still have a chance until that that outright rejection, um, and even with that outright rejection, the Holy Spirit can move back into your life, um, and 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 bring you to repentance. Um, I, I don't. Yeah, again, we don't know the hearts of people, but what was, I always go to the thief on the cross. Where where was the thief on the cross with his unbelief prior to meeting Jesus? Um, he was somewhere in there. Um, so so he said, you know, don't don't let this hypocrite hypocritical attitude bubble up in you, um, because ultimately. Guess what? It's going to be it's going to be made known. It's going to be revealed. The mask will be torn off, uh, and you will and and people will see it. Um, and and that's where the dark shall be heard. And uh, what is said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in private rooms will be proclaimed from the housetops. Um, by your fruits you will be known. By your words you will be discovered. Um, so again, we move from the example of the, the Pharisees to the teaching about not being Pharisaical. Now we move, transition from that. So he, he moves it from, um, this is the, the attitude of the unfaithful. Now, what attitude do you put on as the faithful? If somebody would read verses 4 through, let's take a big section here, 4 through 12. I tell you, my friends, do not hear those who fill the body, and after that have nothing more than they can do. But I will warn you, you are going to sleep after you are killed, and the Lord is asking you about Yes, I tell you, fear me. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, like even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. The one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring the place of God and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, now we get the contrast. He says in the first section, beware. How does he start this section? Do not fear. Do not fear. Yeah. Be aware, but don't fear. Um, were those Pharisees fearful? Were they fearful kind of guys? Was 
Okay. Were, were there were there reasons for the people to fear the Pharisees? Have you ever been at a church with, a, with an authoritative pastor? And there is silence. Well, I think the practice of that has caused a rift in the church that we were at at one time, and half the time in the church no longer stood. Beware the leaven. Right. Right. But it's very it's very important to to understand the distinction. Beware the leaven and do not fear. And and and, and because again, yeah, those those fears those Pharisees had a bit of control. Um, very much so uh, but Jesus reminds them do not fear those who kill the body because why? they can't do anything else so yeah a church might suffer but they can't do any more than that. Because as you were a part of that church, did God relocate you? <laughs> well, for the time being, here you are. <laughs> Until whichever trip you might be on. But, but isn't that, you know, how many of us in here have had an experience at a church that you would say didn't go very smoothly or was disruptive to the life of the congregation? I, I, if, if you've been in a church for any period of time, you've had that occasion. Because how many hypocrites, how many churches have hypocrites? <laughs> how, how, how many churches, um, well, and we already answered it, we're all hypocrites. So at some point, we're going to create that. Um, but we need, we need to deal with the leaven. That's why he says beware of the leaven. We need to deal with the leaven but he says, do not fear. But he then says, I warn you, I'll tell you who to fear. Who's the one to fear? Who, who, who's, the, who's the one? Fear him who after he has killed has authority to cast into hell. That's the devil. That's God. <laughs> God's got that authority. God's got that authority. Yeah. Is this the same passage? I noticed in this one, Luke says, the angels, you're denying me before the angels of God. And somewhere else it says, deny me before my father. Is it the same? I, I it's it's the same. Like it's the same. Right. And, I, and you, you, that's the question I was going to bring up. Okay. Because it's in, it's in Matthew where it's denied before the father. And it's here where it says deny before angels. That's where I was going to pull Dan into the discussion. <laughs> as I tried to search that answer out. Um, I, I, I'm doing this hopefully en enough to to string you along here. 
So who's the one that we should fear? God. Okay. But then what does Luke say? It's exactly. <laughs> Well, and 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 that and that's it, it's not the fear of God that we normally think of the fear of God. Right. The the one we should fear is the one who can decide between heaven and hell. And 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 I think where he's going with that is guess what he's already decided between heaven and hell. You don't need to fear him. You don't need to fear him. He's already decided between heaven and hell. You know. Um, and and not uh, and uh, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? The background on that is that was the sacrifice of the extremely poor person. And Dan, I don't know how you read this, but I I, I almost see two things going on here because when he says you know, um, and not one of them is forgotten before God. And, and I wonder if he's playing two things here. Not one of them is forgotten before God. Talking about the sparrows, because he, obviously he brings that up at the end there. Fear not, you are more value than, than many sparrows. But I'm thinking of the, the poor person whose sacrifice that is. Because that poor person whose sacrifice is, is, is those you know, uh, five sparrows for two pennies. They, they, they are at, probably at the lowest position that they could think of and, and, and I think in some ways not only the, is the sparrow remembered but the one who has to make that sacrifice not one of them is forgotten before God how many people can come into All Saints Lutheran Church and be forgotten has that happened Absolutely. As 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 you have been at congregations, have there been people who have come in and they have been forgotten? Mm -hmm. uh, but not before, and that and that's and that's the beauty here is that's why we don't have to fear God because He doesn't forget even the least of these. Um, now again, it it. it I'm, I'm doing something because I keep hearing my um, so, so I, I think I, again he, he's reminding us that you know the, these these Pharisees we don't need to fear because there is one who has who has greater authority in fact he's the one who has complete authority um, and and again um, so do not fear, um, but believe, but believe, uh, because because we even even the hairs on your head are numbered. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's not such a big job for you. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Here. Right. So, so, you know, uh, again, and and I th and I think that's where the Pharisees tried to. That was their part of their leaven was the fear that they tried to live off of. They tried to live off the fear of the people. That's what an authoritative pastor tries to do, is live off the fear of the people. Um, but but as as Jesus said. That that will eventually, you know, it'll be brought to light, or it'll be shout from, shouted from the rooftops. The the fear of the Pharisees was a real deal. If if the Pharisee it spoke against you and cast you out of the fellowship where you couldn't come to the temple and worship, you were you had no place to go. I mean, and, and you were an outcast among the people. It it wasn't just can't do it online, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> okay, we cast somebody out of this church, okay, uh, for the sake of them returning to the Lord. Right. They can go find another church. Mm -hmm. But...
could not go to another church. And furthermore, the Pharisees' influence to the people that were still of, you know, don't be, you know, when Jesus says, don't be afraid of the Pharisee, I mean, it, there's a great impact there. Right. Do we do the same thing in the church today? Sort of. Pharisaical yeah. behavior. Right. Yeah. Right. But remembering, and, and this is where we all have to be, to is we remember we have to remember the one who has authority over all. Right. Absolutely. Right. Anything else there before we move on? Uh, now again, this is this is then how it's acted out. Okay. So so. So our, our understanding is we have a God that we don't need to fear, but also we need to proclaim him. Um, just, just as the, the proclamation of the Pharisees was, was not that, uh, this, this is then how we are to uh, speak, how we are to acknowledge. Um, yeah, and, and why here is it the acknowledgement before the angels of God? Whereas in Matthew is if you acknowledge me before my father. I could not find anything. Dan? Clearly a parallel passage though. Matthew has it in a slightly different context. Right. Matthew puts it just after the disciples are sent. And then there's a persecution I think. And, and with you saying that, I think, I think a section coming up is going to be a reminder of them being sent. I think this sort of plays into that, um, that whole idea. To, to me, the, the only thing I thought of, and I could not find anything to back it up, um, do the angels of God do the bidding of the Father at the end times? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I'm thinking of is that the angels of God do the bidding of God at the end times that, and, and that would then be the sense of that judgment. So if, if, you, if you acknowledge me before men, the Son acknowledges before the ones who will carry out God's just, justice. That's the only way I first forced and then, then Dan. This reminds me, I can't remember the exact word is in the Bible, but it's where the high priest is brought before the God. And I get the sense of the angels of the truth because it's a judgment seat. And it saves the And then it says, Lord, that they can do it. You know, that you say to me, say, take off these words, not from I'm making some mm. It's kind of mind here at that point. Okay. Okay. Dan? Yeah, my thoughts are in a similar vein. The, the, the image that I'm getting is in a courtroom and a, a defense that's being raised. And I think the key focus here is who's defending? It's Christ. That's who's, that's who's mounting our defense. But, okay, uh, the Father's there, the, the angels are bearing witness, etc., etc. Um, develop whatever picture you want about it. The focus is the person, Jesus Christ, is doing our defense. He's the one who's arguing on my behalf. And thereby we don't have to fear right. God who can <laughs> condemn to hell because we have Jesus who is speaking in our, well, on our I mean, behalf. Well, just told us to fear him. Um, but this, I think, sometimes, it, you know, we remember that this word fear has a sense of reverence. Correct. 
rather than run away. I was thinking of the run away. We don't have to run away from him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we want to, like we should run away from the Pharisees. Yeah, the the Pharisees we should be running away from because their leaven is not healthy for us. Because notice the transition. Because the last chapter was all directed toward the Pharisees, the old standard of church, and and then we immediately get here. But he began to say to his disciples first. So yes, I I I, I truly believe that. And and again, the whole idea. If if we go to Matthew's gospel, where this section comes in in regards to their sending, and I I truly believe. Uh, when we get to 22, verse 22, it's a reminder again of their past sending, but don't be anxious about anything. You know, because what, what did he, when, when he sent the disciples in Luke, what did he tell them not to do? Don't take anything with you. You'll be taken care of. And, and when we get to 22, you get, do not be anxious about, it, about your life and so forth and so on. Um, because again, I, I think it's that, that same reminder is that, and again, I've seen time and time again in, in uh, the commentary from, from Concordia, um, and, and Dan, you've brought this up. This, this is a catechism for the early church. So, so think of Luther's small catechism, which, which many of us used in our youth to get through. This is what Luke is doing here. He, this is a catechism. This, this is a, a book of instruction in preparation for living out the faith. Yeah. One last keen thought. Anecdotally, um, and I don't know if Luke's doing this on purpose or not, but it's beautiful. The, he says, and then the Pharisees were you know, eager to try and catch him in something he might say. And then you look, the 98% of the next uh, series of texts is all red letters. <laughs> like, that didn't shut him up. <laughs> that's, what, that, that's why I thought, you know, leading into that is, yeah. it, was Jesus going to say something that was going to offend them? Absolutely. Sure. And, and, and again, aren't we told that by Paul, that, you know, you are offended by what Jesus has to say. It should offend us. Uh, because again, it's not us. Um, and, and then we get this, this interesting word here. Everyone who speaks against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So you speak against Jesus, you will be, you will be forgiven. But if you speak against the Holy Spirit... That ties back to what you were saying before. But as long as you, you, know, you may be sinned, but as long as you, there's a chance that the Holy Spirit can still but when that stop, but you clearly reject the Holy Spirit. Uh, the comment that I'm that I like to make, one says it's attributing God's work to Satan. But you see that not really right tonight. Mm -hmm. And the other is somebody that is just, and I think this gets back to what Dan said earlier. When you sin, you speak against Jesus. You're, you're, you're speaking against the Father's will. You're speaking against that which he instructed us on how to live our lives. So every, every time I sin, I'm speaking against Jesus. What a fine example I show. What a light I shine when, when I do that because I'm not showing Jesus to anybody. Bob? I, I thought the uh, message had kind of an interesting interpretation of that. Is it bad the Son of Man out of misunderstanding or ignorance? That can be overlooked. But if you're normally attacking God himself, Taking aim at the Holy Spirit, that won't be over. <laughs> yeah. I also don't want us to miss 
the fact that in this paragraph, Jesus equates himself with the Holy Spirit. Jesus has just put himself on par with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So don't miss that and uh, put that in your uh, you know, bevy of text to reassure anyone who wants to know whether or not Jesus claims to be God. Um, he's he's making a good case right here that he thinks so. And, and forced to your point, then when we get to 11, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, and Jack, this goes back to what you were saying, you know, the, the threat of the Pharisee was to be brought before them, because if you're brought before them, you're going to be cast out. You're going to be cast out. Well, I'm thinking, I believe it was the blind man that Jesus healed, and they, and they took him, and the parents, and they... Mm -hmm. They were all fearful of, you know. I mean, the parents were, you know, don't ask us, ask him. He's of age. We don't want anything to do with it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but notice what Jesus, again, this comes in with my faith is frail, my faith is weak. Uh, if I rely on myself but realize that no matter how frail or how weak my faith is there there's an empowerment behind it and where does that empowerment come from the Holy Spirit um, and, and that's what's happening here is yeah when you get set in that place don't worry about what you're going to say don't be anxious about how you're going to defend yourself oh by the way what did it just say about heaven who's going to defend us in heaven the Son of Man. So if the Son of Man defends us, can't can't God if 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 it's going to be taken care of in, of in heaven, can it be taken care of here on earth? Absolutely. Um, and again, that goes back to what it said before um, in verse three. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be claimed proclaimed on the housetops. So what does that tell you about what you should be doing in the dark and in the private rooms? Righteous deeds. <laughs> <laughs> Your words should be spoken whether they are in private or whether they are in public. They should mirror the same thing. Um, because again, as the, as the Holy Spirit moves that, um, and, and he's, he's going to move it through, you know, through the faith that he gives you. Um, That's it for, for that. Anybody else in that section? Uh, you know, this is a little less up there. You brought it up. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you know, you talk about uh, uh, oppressive kinds of pastors. But, all pastors and, but you've also said that all of us are hypocrites. So all pastors are hypocrites. Right. And you know, I don't know what it's like in your home, but my wife likes to remind me of that all the time. <laughs> um, if, if, if it weren't for this, for Jesus saying, don't, don't worry, you, you're forgiven. Even if you speak against the Son of Man. You, you know, in other words, right. oh, hypocrite, Pastor Sparling, you're forgiven. Right. Um, but what gets me into trouble, if I, if I follow this, is this this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What gets me into trouble as a pastor now is if I forget that you're forgiven too. Mm. That's a, that's a pastor's mm. version of a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. See, um, yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm a hypocrite, and I, I have to get up and preach every Sunday, and every word of my preaching is, is hypocrisy because I'm a sinner. Um, where I get myself into trouble, if I would is if I fail to remember, oh goodness, you're, you're forgiven. It's not just me. <laughs> right? And so the, the, the truly oppressive pastors are the ones who have this cynical attitude about their parishioners and fail to remember that the, that the, the whole church is, is working through their hypocrisy together. You know, 
And uh, yeah, so and it's a little bit of an esoteric point, and I'm just scratching the surface of it in, in my thoughts here. But you know, this is a great text to study as a group of pastors, I think. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I had an incident in my life one time where I, I had sinned against somebody and I went and repented and the person said, I'll forgive you when I see you change. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's their problem, not yours. But the point is, you just did change. You saw your sin and you confessed it. Right, but, but going with what Dan said, it, it, it's at that point where that person should... You know, and, and think of the other times that we that that we we're in that position where somebody comes to us seeking forgiveness, and, and then you know, you or you might say something, "I'll forgive you, but I won't forget." Yeah. You know, um, I again, I, I'm I'm working this one out with you right at the same. That, working this out at the same time as you are is is then that does that then become the blasphemy against the spirit well that person blasphemed against the spirit in their response to you right um, that was their blasphemy um, but of course now the ball's in your court <laughs> you know I mean, you're never free uh, right. you're never going to justify yourself um, you're, you're, you're never uh, you're never out of need of this forgiveness that comes from the Son of Man. You're never out of need of it. The only way you're going to justify yourself if you, if you hang yourself on a cross. Yeah. And I don't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Jan, well, you with me on that one, huh? <laughs> Lisa, did you have something? You're not going to wait out in the new war? No. Well, I mean, forgiveness is not just lip service either. I mean, you can't just want to give you. Well, that, the person that you spoke with, they, here's the big difference. They don't, they haven't been given the keys. Exactly. Uh, so it is a, perhaps, and again, this is like scratching the surface, it's perhaps a slightly different thing for them to fail to forgive you than it is for you to, for you to forgive them. Um, it may be a slightly different thing for them to fail to forgive you than it is for you to confess your sin to them. You will be keeps in that relationship. Mm -hmm. That's a real thing. Well, and, and, and now that you brought up keys, the reality of it is, who truly holds the keys? Well, and, 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 and again, I've had that, I've had that experience. I've, I've been in it. I do a lot of dumb stuff. <laughs> I do a lot of dumb stuff where I have to go and repent. Golly. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, 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 but there have been times where I've, I've been where I've had to go to repent and the repentance is not received and at that point has my repentance be has my repentance been devalued not in the eyes of the Lord there you go my repentance has not been devalued because my repentance is turning back to God and in my repentance to speaking it to somebody else if they have rejected my repentance does that devalue my repentance? No, do not fear not, those that fill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. Do not fear that. Correct. So getting back to the and, and this is this really becomes the tough part of the teaching is, you know, if that church turns you away, are they really doing the work of God? Yes, in some situations. And no well, well, <laughs> right, right. If, 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 it, if it's in the if it's in the Matthew eighteen sense, yes. yes. But I mean, if if it's that that church that is doing it pharisaically, yeah. right. Correct. You, you mentioned it about the cross that we don't want to put ourselves on the cross, and no, we don't. But we do have a responsibility 
of picking up our cross daily. So in, in a sense, we do put ourselves on a cross because our cross, can, our our burden is 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 to follow Christ. That's that's what our call is, and, and it's not easy in this world to be a follower of Christ and get it right. And I can't remember, it, it's a contemporary author, it's a pastor. Um, and I, I wish I could remember who said it. it. It gave me a perspective on that, that, you know, taking up your cross. He framed it in the sense of repentance. Yeah. Taking, taking up your cross is acknowledging your sin and, 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 it's all of it. and going and repenting. You know, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. So deny yourself because that's where sin comes. Take up your cross, actually go to the cross, yeah. at the foot of the cross. Repent because the only way we can follow him is if we turn and go. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? Thank you, Dan, for that little esoteric uh, diversion that we just ran into. Um, parable of the rich fool. What parable? The rich fool. Picking up at verse 13, going through 21. Who would like to read? Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is this the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God? That's not no, question. it's not a question. You put a this in there. <laughs> so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God? It would be a rhetorical question <laughs> if it was. Um, and, and again, follow, because again, who, who is the nearby example of being very covetous? Pharisees. The Pharisees. But I think what we, and, and this becomes the difficulty of the trap that we sometimes fall into. Pointing at the others. What? Pointing at the others. Boy, we've been around each other too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what we get for our Wednesdays, right? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and yeah, we, we, we can easily fall into the trap. Point. Well, yeah, that's the Pharisees. That's the Pharisees. Um, and, and, and so, yes, in the threat of things, this is very Pharisaical behavior, but we are, the, we are them. We are the Pharisees. So, so we get this unidentified someone in the crowd which is a great example because there is we all identify with this someone in the crowd and and what's his what's what's his first here Jesus is in the midst of teaching them good things about how to be a disciple how to live out the faith life and what's his concern in that moment I, yeah I, I, I want my fair inheritance you know uh, I I I want to make sure I be I'm treated fairly. I'm not even sure if oh. it's a matter of fairness. I don't think this man has any claim on that inheritance. Okay. 
chances are his brother is the oldest by, the, by, by, by cultural rights his brother is, has rights to the entire thing chances are so uh, yeah I think this man is asking Jesus to get involved in something that God has no business getting involved in together. Or could it be in the sense also as we, as the world judge, look at our world today. When, when we start throwing around justice and fairness. I think it would fall, would fall in the same. So justice it, it, is me getting the outcome that I desire. Right. That's the definition of justice. It, it's my three-year-old son when he, when he was in trouble. Uh, and we told him to come on out here. You know, we need to talk to you. You're not the boss of my body. <laughs> <laughs> Typical three-year-old. What do you learn? <laughs> uh, but it's also the the answer of a twenty-year-old, of a thirty-year-old, of a fifty-year-old, of a seventy-year-old. You're not the boss of my body. Yeah, you know, you're not the boss of me. Um, so yeah, I, I, yeah exactly that this was something that was not his that he wanted that he that he wanted the heavenlies to get involved in yeah I think it's it, actually the more I think about it the more, the more clear it is because Jesus immediately goes to covetousness and as we understand the definition of coveting which is the desire for something that isn't yours. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what that's Jesus getting dragged into a um, yeah a, a situation that uh, he has no business. With. Right, and I think it, I think at the same time is if I can stretch it this far with what Jesus is doing is. You've got something right in front of you that you have that you're denying. Because that's, a, that's ultimately where he's going with this. Uh, because we, 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 get it, we get it a little further later on is you've got something right in front of you that you have. Instead, you are so concerned about what you don't have. And then what you don't have is that of the earth, and what you do have is right in front of you, which is of the heavenlies. And you're asking the heavenlies to take care of stuff that really doesn't matter all that much. Um, here's a proof that, uh, that against the stupid argument that Jesus is a socialist. If, if Jesus was a socialist, if he believed in the equal distribution of wealth as a, as a policy, he would have gladly gotten involved in this situation. Okay. Right? Okay. Yeah. Not that I'm making an argument that he's a capitalist. I'm not making that argument. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. Right, right. It, 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 it's, it's always that argument when a pastor speaks something. Don't... <coughs> Don't, right, don't, don't make the contrast his argument. Right, right. The contrast is not necessarily his argument. Exactly. Um, and so he tells this story, this beautiful story. Uh, that this rich man produced plentifully. The land, note that, the land produced plentifully. It wasn't his effort. It was the land gave it to him. And, and, and that's really significant. The land gave it to him. And then he's, then he's pondering, what should I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. So what do I do? Tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Well, and... and, and Notice, well, notice the money to do it too. It's all well, and, and, and right, right. You know, and, and that's really the sense of here's what you have in front. Here's what you do have. You have faith, and what does faith call us to do? Faith calls us to share of the abundance that God has given to us. 
I think I said something like that yesterday. <laughs> uh, share, share in the abundance that God has given to you. But no, he wants to keep it all for himself. Not only does he want to, to keep the tangible things, look at his conversation. He says, soul. He's, talk, he's talking to himself. Well, what, is that why it's capitalized? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's talking to himself. And an interesting thing that the word soul there is suke, which is where we get psych, psych, psychological. Uh, uh, but th that word is going to return in, in a few moments in another place, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, so, so he's 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 having this conversation. He's not talking with his family about what to do. He's not talking to his financial advisor with what to do. He's not talking with his thriving agent with what to do. He's not talking with his spouse or children in what to do. His whole conversation is with himself. Oh, by the way, who, who, is, who is he not including in that conversation besides all those other people? Wow. God. Well, he's got the triumph. Yeah, me, myself, and I. That's it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, he, he called me that word. <laughs> you, you know, so, 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 you know, he, he, he says, I've got plenty for many years. <laughs> And he should have started the conversation with God because then God God doesn't wait. God breaks into the conversation and say, guess what? This night your soul is required of you. You know, the greatest gift that he has been given, he forsook for all the other gifts. Yeah. So the question is, what is Jesus teaching this man who has asked him this question? This is the story, this is the parable that Jesus uses as an answer to this man who asks him to help, you know, help him out with his, his desire for his brothers and miracles. So what's Jesus' answer? What is, yeah, what is, what's Jesus telling this guy? This is what I want to do. His bars are gone. Yeah. His bars are gone. Mm -hmm. Sort of, I think he's saying, look at what you've already got. Right. Look what you've already got. Work with what you've got. I think. Well, well and, and, and that's that's where I was going because again, Jesus is right here, you know, equipping these people for living out their life of faith. Here, to me, it's not it's not just not the only the matter of being able to take a breath, life, soul, and I think that's again maybe why the the translators because it can be translated differently. I think that's why they they use soul here because I think it's something deeper than just our ability to breathe. I, I, I again I, I think the greatest gift that God gives to us is beyond life it's that faith that he gives to us that enlivens us and and i think that's that's where i think because again we, at the end so so is the one who and that's why i said it could be a rhetorical question because it, it causes you to think so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward god but so, jesus would prefer that this guy comes to him and says uh teacher how can I, how can I give from what the land has already given me? Right. Rather than, teacher, how can you help me get more right. of what I've already got? Or how can, how can I keep my hands on what I've got? Now, now. What's that? Middle lesson of poetry lessons. Uh, it's more than that. Yes, but why should you count your blessings? Because we've got an abundance here. So that you can figure out how to distribute them to those who have made them. Yep. And please notice, you know, uh, go, hop from 21 to 34. Yeah. 
How from 21 to 34, you know, we're, we're going to be dealing more with this. And, and it really gets, it, and that's why I say this is really about what has God given to you? And move it beyond just the stuff. Because that's, that's the next session. section. And we're out of time. But uh, the next section really talks about the stuff. Um, and, and, I, and I think he's leading with that is, is the sense of the stuff. Don't let that stuff. Is stuff good? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. stuff. stuff. Stuff is good. Well, even the wrong stuff can be good. The right stuff, yeah. Um, because sometimes through the wrong stuff we learn the lessons that we causes us to identify the right stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, he 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 felt he felt completely self sufficient. Soul, what should I do? He didn't turn toward God at all. And oh yeah, he didn't acknowledge God giving him all that stuff. Um, so. And as soon as he took care of himself, he relaxed. As soon as he looked as you know, he right. his, figured out how he was going to deal with his largesse, and his next move is to relax, eat, drink, and be merry. As soon as he was self self satisfied, he he was done. Do you think this has anything to teach us about retirement? I wouldn't know I'm not retired. I'm off the hook on that No, you're not off the hook because someday you will be. Clearly. And then and if you wait until retirement to plan for retirement. Well, we will say goodbye. We will say a prayer and say goodbye to the Facebook group and then we will go into to our prayer here in person. Most gracious Heavenly Father, again, we, we thank you. Uh, we thank you that, uh, that we don't have to fear those who can only harm the body, uh, but we need to uh, put our fear, our trust in you uh, because of what you do for us, not only here on this earth, but for eternity. And, and let us see that which is important um, of primary importance, of first importance, of all importance, that which you have given to us through our life and through our faith. And so by doing that, we can manage the rest uh, and, and manage it in a way that uh, your blessing to us can be blessings to other. Now, Heavenly Father, as we go from this place, enable us to have open eyes, open minds, and open hearts to see those opportunities as they lay before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we will see ya. <laughs>